Hello, um, apologies for the slightly warm attire. Um, I'm going to start off by examining pre-Christian celebrations in general, uh, a few things I didn't mention in the harvest video, and then I'm going to zoom into more specifically Christmas related things, and then at the end of the video I'll mention a couple of Christmas traditions that we do nowadays, and think about whether there was any equivalent or any ancestral form of those in the Anglo-Saxon period. Um, a pre-Christian Anglo-Saxon winter festival is something that we're very, very confident happened, but unfortunately it's one of those things that we can tell annoyingly little about. So this video is going to explore the evidence that we do have. We know the festival was called Yeol, and that word survives as Yule today, and that comes from the Proto-Germanic word Yehran, Yehran. So short of having written evidence from the time, we could take the same approach as we often take with linguistics and try and triangulate some vague idea of Yule from uh, things that we do have written evidence of that are conceptually close to it. And two adjacent things that we do have evidence of are the Anglo-Saxon idea of Christmas after Christianization and the Old Norse Winter Festival of Yule, which was the medieval Scandinavian equivalent of Yule. And we do actually have writing that tells us about Scandinavian pre-Christian traditions. So in that, in that case, we do actually have written evidence. And we can supplement all that with the scraps of direct evidence we do have. I'll just say a quick word of caution against doing what it's tempting to do, which is to take the Scandinavian traditions and just superimpose them onto the Anglo-Saxons as if they did exactly the same things and it was a, a carbon copy. Because although the Old Norse traditions and the Anglo-Saxon traditions are related to each other, they're not the same traditions um, and they're, you know, they're separated not only by a geographic gap, but also a time gap in some sense. So for one thing, remember the Anglo-Saxons didn't take the Old Norse belief system. The two belief systems were kind of cousins and came from an ancestral belief system a few hundred years earlier. So we're talking about a few hundred years worth of time gap in a system that we already know was very dynamic, even within the places that we do know about it. So in Scandinavia, the roles of gods and the names of gods uh, switched around from place to place and even from story to story. And on the other hand, we can't just assume that Christianity ploughed through every tradition and destroyed it all. We know metrical charms survived Christianization. We know belief in elves survived Christianization. So clearly not everything pagan died with Christianity. The Norse equivalent, Yule, had a lot to do with their gods and venerating their gods or maintaining a relationship with their gods. So the saga of Hawkon Gorthy goes into a bit of a description about the Norse celebration immediately before Christianization. So it says people would gather at a particular building, a sort of temple, and they'd spend three days from the summer solstice onwards eating and drinking in and around this temple, and they would sacrifice livestock and horses on these pedestals, and they'd use sticks or bundles of sticks called hlauteinar to flick the blood of the livestock and the horses all over the temple and also over the men who were present. So if the account there is trustworthy, then that's how it was in parts of Scandinavia. And there are two big things we can pull out of that account and connect with known Anglo-Saxon archaeology. The first one is the idea of a specific building for festivals to happen in a pre-Christian context. And one of probably a few words for this in Old English was haur, which becomes the modern word harrow. And we have a pretty convincing example of a temple of this kind in Yevering, in the very, very far north of England, in what's now Northumberland. Uh, where we have a few timber buildings, all from about the same time. There are several halls, and what's been interpreted as a sort of tiered seating structure which faced onto a shrine or an altar or something like that. And most of these buildings were burnt down at some point and then replaced with other buildings. And the Anglo-Saxon historian Bede, or Beda, wrote about the Christianization of the people at this very site. And he said it was a royal site where the king and queen spent some time, and as well as the tiered seating, there was also a man buried with a large pole and a goat's head, so there might have been something ceremonial going on there as well, in a, in a pre-Christian context. Whether that had anything to do with winter, unfortunately, is not clear. Another thing that's relevant from the Norse account is animal sacrifice, in particular horse sacrifice. And horse sacrifice seems to have been a big thing in pre-Christian Germanic cultures, and a lot of Indo-European cultures in general, although um, you never know how much that's to do with them being related to each other or how much it is to do with geographic uh, diffusion of culture. So I might, I might at some point do a video about um, pre-Christian horse sacrifice practices, but that, that, that's for a separate video. But certainly the Anglo-Saxons did have traditions of either sacrificing or burying, or possibly both, horses in the same kind of spaces as humans are sacrificed, uh, sacrificed as, in the same kinds of spaces, sorry, as humans are buried. 
There are loads of examples of pre-Christian Anglo-Saxon sites where horses have been buried, whether that's the whole horse or just its head, and they're often associated with people, so sometimes they're actually in the same pit as a person, sometimes they're buried in their own pit, which may or may not be near a human grave, but in those cases it's not always clear whether they're supposed to be associated with each other. Sometimes they're cremated, and the cremated remains are buried, and there's an interesting paper I'll link in the description that goes into more detail about that. Having said all that, the Norse account mentions all kinds of animals, not just horses, and these horse burials that I've spoken of, there's no reason to think they're to do with an annual celebration. There are loads of ways to interpret them. It might just be that an important person has died and their horse gets killed and buried with them. It could be any number of things. And you can find parallels to that idea in Scandinavia, which I'll talk about in a later video. So it might actually be that the goat's head buried at Yevering is more relevant here because it's an example of an animal, not just a horse, that's been buried in a, an apparently ceremonial context. And for the etymology people out there, the, the words for horse and goat in Old English were horse from Proto-Germanic russon and gart from Proto-Germanic reit. That doesn't necessarily tell us that sacrificing animals was a specifically Yule thing to do. But eating a lot of meat was part of the Old Norse tradition and also the later medieval tradition of Christmas, although in later medieval England a lot of the time that was preceded by several days of fasting. In the video on autumn celebrations I also mentioned that slaughtering cattle was a big thing at that time of year as well. So the blood aspect of animal sacrifice, the sprinkling blood everywhere, is not directly attested in any Anglo-Saxon text I know of. It's a bit confusing because you have the word blot, which means sacrifice, and November was called blotmonoth, sacrifice month. And the word blot sounds a lot like it should be related to blood, which was blood in Old English. But as far as we can tell, there's actually no historical connection between blot and blood. But there is another word that's more promising, which is bless. And that's used in a Christian context now, but it comes from an older Germanic word. So the old English word was bledsion, bledsion, which was the word in the south. But in the north, you get the form blödsion. And that's common that, um, that northern old English preserves this older er sound where southern old English has unrounded it to e. And in turn this er sound, which, which doesn't exist in modern English unfortunately, is the I mutated version of the Proto-Germanic sound or. So the root word in Proto-Germanic here is probably blood, which did mean blood. So the word bless originally had connotations of blood, of kind of doing, doing blood onto somebody effectively, putting blood onto somebody. So you can easily see how that might be connected to the Old Norse idea of flicking blood onto people in a ceremonial way. And I think perhaps the later practice of blessing people with holy water is also, uh, is also relevant here because the fact that that practice was linked by early Christians to the word bless suggests that perhaps there's some element of putting liquid onto somebody, um, whether, whether that's blood or water. Um, but that's, maybe that's a bit clutching at straws. So I think these are little etymological hints at the idea that ceremonies did involve killing animals, possibly sacrificing animals, and flicking or somehow putting their blood onto people. In terms of when Yule happened in the year, there was an Anglo-Saxon month called Arra Yeola, before Yule, which is roughly in line with December, and one called Afterra Yeola, which means after Yule, and that's roughly in line with January. So Yule seems to happen at roughly the same time of year as it does now, although it probably lasts several days in what's now late December. Beda talks about a specific celebration called Mordranit, Mother's Night, and that was held on the night of the 24th of December. And traditionally the 25th of December was when the new year started for the Anglo-Saxons. And he said Mordranit was celebrated by the heathens. He doesn't go into much detail about why they called it Mother's Night, but he says he suspects it's because of the ceremonies they enacted on that night. The idea of a winter celebration focusing on female ancestral figures is really well recorded in Scandinavia in the form of Dizablot, which is a celebration of the Dizir, the female spirits that control what happens to people. So Dizablot in Scandinavia has been associated with various different times ranging from sort of September to March. So we can't say for certain that this is the same thing as the Anglo-Saxon Mordranit. As many of you will know, Christmas trees were introduced to Britain from Germany during the Victorian period, so the modern idea of a Christmas tree isn't um, or wasn't an Anglo-Saxon thing. But we do know trees were very important in the Anglo-Saxon belief system, so it's not impossible that they might have done something tree-related in their Christmas celebrations as well. We know pre-Christian Germanic cultures in general had sacred trees, so there's an example from Germany from the 1700s referenced in the life of St Boniface, 
and they say that there was an enormous sacred oak tree that the pagans called the Oak of Jupiter in their own language. And Latin texts a lot of the time used Roman gods as kind of equivalents or stand-ins for local gods. And Jupiter is very often used to translate the local god who's called Dornar in Germany, Thunor in England, and Thor in Scandinavia. So it might be that specific trees were connected to specific gods. There's also a tree from the 1000s from Uppsala in Sweden, I might have pronounced that wrong, where sacrifices and things were apparently made. And that's from an account by Adam of Bremen. So there might have been something tree-related going on, but not as we know it. Father Christmas came a lot later, and we have no attestation of Father Christmas from the Anglo-Saxon period, unfortunately. Yule logs, again, seem like the kind of thing that, that would be Anglo-Saxon, but they only appear in writing fairly late on. So that's the tradition of setting a log on fire so that it burns over several days. It's really impossible to say when that started. And then, of course, the seasonal things that have been mentioned through the ages, like robins being more active, mistletoe, which stays green through winter, holly, and a lot of other things that make Christmas in this part of the world feel the way it does. Thank you very much indeed for watching, and I will see you next time.